Hello everyone, welcome to the lecture on uncertainty modeling in AI. And today we are going to talk about variational autoencoder and the mixture density networks. So today's lecture is a little bit special where I'm going to talk about the relation or how the graphical modeling concepts that we have been learning can be applied to the popular deep learning techniques that are commonly used today in research. So in particular, in variational autoencoder, the first part of today's lecture, I'm going to talk about the concepts of uh, variational inference, how to make use of the derivation of the lower bound as well as the proposal distribution from the variational inference and how can we apply this into uh, what we call the variational autoencoder which is a type of deep network architecture design. And in the second part of the lecture, I'm going to talk about uh, what is called the mixture density network and in particular I will show how the mixture model that we have learned in lecture 7 can be applied to deep learning to form this deep learning architecture which is known as the mixture density network. Of course I didn't invent any of today's material. A lot of the slides and content of today's lecture are adopted from uh, this tutorial on variational autoencoders which was written by Carl in 2016 and I also took some of the references from the original paper of variational autoencoder which is written by King Ma and Welling in ICLR 2014 as well as uh, the mixture density network which was actually invented by Christopher Bishop and this was very well documented in the last part of uh, chapter 5 where he talks about uh, neural networks. I strongly encourage every one of you to take a look at these uh, three reference materials after today's lecture and hopefully by the end of today's lecture uh, all of you would be able to explain the difference between uh, discriminative and generative models. In particular, uh, we, we know that most of the deep networks or the deep learning architectures are discriminative in nature. Uh, and what we are talking about would be those networks that are used for classification. For example, some of the, uh, uh, although this is out of the syllabus, Here's a additional information that there are other networks or popular networks such as the VGG or ResNet uh, that are discriminative in nature. They are doing either the classification task or the regression task, but these are always uh, discriminative in nature. And today we are going to look at the two different networks which are generative in nature. In particular, the first network that we are going to do look at, which is the VAE or otherwise known as the variational autoencoder. And we will see what's the difference between the discriminative and uh, generative network in more detail in the subsequent uh, slides. Next, we will look at how to describe the concept behind the variational autoencoder and in particular I'll step you through the derivation of the variational autoencoder and how this particular deep network is being designed from the principle of uh, graphical model and of course we'll also look at some examples on how it can be used to generate uh, new images hence uh, this particular network here the VAE here it's actually also called the generative networks because uh, with the VAE we can actually generate new images. Uh, it's a generative model that we can generate new images uh, from the just using uh, deep network. It can, uh, in other words, it can actually be used to hallucinate new scenes that doesn't exist in the real world. Finally, we'll look at the mixture density network. We'll look at how this mixture density network can be formulated. The architecture of the deep network uh, it's actually uh, formulated based on the mixture density model and we will look at how to use the mixture density network to solve the what we call the inverse problem where it's actually a non-bijective uh, problem where given a single input there could be multiple feasible solutions that exist and because of this inverse problem the usual discriminative model that we have which is uh, taking one input and one specific output will not be able to handle this particular uh, inverse problem here and we'll see how the mixture density model can be used to resolve this problem 
So before we look at the detail of the variational autoencoder as well as the mixture density network, let's recall that we have actually seen in the previous lecture on the difference between a discriminative versus a generative model. So we have uh, seen in the previous lecture that a generative model uh, simply implies that uh, uh, it refers to the approaches that uh, a machine learning approach that explicitly or implicitly model the distributions between the inputs and the outputs. So here, more specifically, what we are looking at would be the likelihood function that we are uh, modeling as a generative model. So in, the, uh, in, in other words, for a generative model, to, in order for us to model the posterior of uh, which class this object is belonging to, condition upon all the observation, we we'll usually use the base rule to model this in terms of the likelihood function, uh, x upon uh, condition upon ck, multiplied by the prior distribution of the class as well as the normalizer, uh, which is a normalizing constant of the uh, marginalization over this uh, over all the uh, classes ck itself which in other words the denominator here is simply p of x so the difference here is that uh, because we are making use of the likelihood function we are making use of the base theorem to express this posterior distribution as the likelihood function here this means that we have to model this guy here the likelihood function here explicitly and what, they, what this means is that for every class of objects, uh, suppose that this is a classification problem, for every class of object that we have, there is a distribution, for example, a Gaussian distribution. Uh, now, suppose that uh, I condition upon that X is drawn from a certain class. What I'm saying here is that for all the uh, X that I have, the sample that I have, is going to follow uh, this particular distribution for that particular class uh, that means that x is my observation here where uh, what I'm saying here is that if this is true that means that I'm modeling uh, the this particular likelihood function here uh, we have also seen in the MCMC uh, sampling uh, lecture that we it's possible for us to draw a sample under this particular distribution this is why it's called a generative model imagine that uh, this is a class of images for example uh, this class of images is the uh, images of a office environment for example so condition upon the office environment what i'm saying here is that if i can model this likelihood function condition upon the condition upon the office environment this means that if x here refers to all my uh, images that is from that particular uh, uh, office environment from that particular class of environment that I'm talking about here uh, what this means is that I can actually generate new images by uh, drawing samples under this particular distribution and hence this is why it's also called the uh, generative uh, model by sampling from this likelihood distribution and in comparison there's another class of uh, models machine learning models which is otherwise known as the discriminative uh, model here so in this particular approach instead of modeling the posterior distribution with our base uh, theorem and, and it, as a result uh, making use of the likelihood function to express this posterior distribution here we are going to model the posterior distribution here directly uh, using this particular function. What this means is that instead of modeling the distribution between the inputs and the outputs, uh, which is x condition upon ck here, I'm going to uh, simply use a function to approximate this or learn a function can help me to get the posterior directly where I simply treat x here as my input. So this means that I'll give x to my function which this function is parameterized by some parameter and what happens here is that given this x and with the parameter that is learned i'll directly output the class that i'm interested in so in this case here a linear regression problem would be an example uh, i give a few observations here so these are my x over here so what i'm learning here is that all the parameters which is uh, m and c in the function of uh, y equals to mx plus c so this means that i'm learning this particular line here as my function 
and whichever input that I have in the future. So this means that if I sample a point here, if I have a point here, I want to find what's the class that it belongs to or what's the output, what's the Y over here, the value of Y over here. If I were to just call this simply as the uh, parameter of Y, then this would simply means that I would just need to look up this particular function of Y equals to MX plus C and compute this value here. And in this case here, there's absolutely no way for us to generate a new sample of X, which is in our observation space, as well as the input space over here. Uh, to be more specific, uh, another example here, which is perhaps more interesting uh, to us, here during learning, uh, we model the posterior probability uh, of a discriminative model. Now suppose that uh, here it's uh, coming back to the example, the very first example that I gave earlier, where uh, we simply classify the uh, images, all the images collections that we have into different classes of uh, rooms, for example. So here uh, we let us denote the the room type as uh, Z. So this Z would be one out of K classes here. It could be a bedroom, it could be a dining room, and it could be an office room, for example, and so on and so forth. So here, uh, by talking about the discriminative model, what we are talking about here would be to model the posterior of P of Z condition upon X, where X here is simply our image. The, this is our observation of the image. and. Uh, and this particular z here would be our latent random variable of the class type that we're interested in. So when we talk about discriminative model, what we are actually referring to would be this particular posterior probability here, that we are directly modeling this po posterior probability in terms of a boundary or in terms of a decision boundary here. So simply, we are learning this classifier to classify these two sets of uh, this set of images into two different class as shown in this example here. So here we can directly based on the all the observation count the frequency and directly fit this into a function which uh, can be parameterized by theta. So here I'm going giving x here and then this would output z all my observed uh, all the input and output observations that I have for learning. So after this uh, fitting of this function, uh, which is actually the decision boundary, so this mapping function here would be directly equivalent to this decision boundary, all I would end up with would be all these sets of numbers of the probabilities on whether an input image belongs to bedroom or belongs to the dining room uh, class. Here we can see that there's simply no way of us generating new images in this particular setting. Uh, which is only used for a decision, a classification, as a classification problem. So here an example would be what we have looked at in uh, when we talk about the conditional random field uh, chapter. Uh, in that case, we were talking about logistic regression, where uh, that's simply a discriminative model. So uh, what it actually means here is that uh, we are learning that decision boundary in the logistic regression. And the commonly known uh, convolutional network that you might have uh, seen in your research or in other courses uh, in NUS. So uh, here, uh, this uh, all these convolutional, most of the convolutional uh, deep networks that we have seen, it's actually uh, a discriminative model where you simply, this particular deep neural network, uh, it actually X as a function approximator, universal function approximator, can actually be written in this way, where you have a set of weights. So all these weights are your neurons in the, uh, it could be an MLP, where you have all the neurons that are linked together. So what you are trying to learn here is that you are trying to learn all these weights, which we simply co uh, collectively uh, write as data here. And what happens here is that you will finally uh, get to an output of Y over here. And then you have a set of inputs over here, which we call X. So these are the neural network, uh, which can be simply denoted as a box over here, where your input of X is going to give you an output of Y. So this is actually a decision boundary. So F hack X here, if I uh, were to represent this particular deep neural network with a function, this is the function that we are a highly nonlinear function that we are learning using the deep neural network. But uh, 
at the end of the day, it's, it's just a mapping function that we are learning that maps the input space into the output space. And in this case here, uh, we can use also convolutional uh, network. So this is a case of MLP, but we can also, uh, suppose that we have a 2D image as an input. We can also slide the convolutional kernel and learn this convolutional kernel in the convolutional neural networks. For example, VGG or ResNet or uh, some earlier networks such as the LXNet, etc. So all this network, it belongs to discriminative models where what we are trying to learn is actually this particular decision boundary here. So here's the example of uh, during the inference of a discriminative network. Once we have found the parameters that uh, that parameterize the posterior distribution or this sim simply this particular function here of x, the input would be x and where we learn all the data and this function is going to map it into y which is the class that we are interested in for that particular input of x over here. And uh, so during in inference time, we'll simply make use of this mapping function, which is actually the decision boundary to determine which class that particular input image belongs to. Here's an example where I'm given this particular image here as my input. So x would be equals to this image here. The objective would be to directly find what's uh, Z over here. I want to know what class this particular image comes from. So uh, pictorically, this means that given this particular image here, I want to figure out where it lies on uh, which side of this decision boundary. Suppose that uh, it's only a binary classification. This means that Z here is going to take either 0 or 1 or bedroom and uh, dining room. So here, uh, the uh, by making use of this particular mapping function that we have learned, we'll be easily able to determine whether this particular image here, on which particular class it belongs to. Obviously, this image belongs to a bedroom class, so it should lie somewhere here. Now I've seen how the discriminative model can be used to determine the class of an input image in the previous slide. The next question that we want to ask is that, can we actually make use of this particular model to generate new samples of the images given the class of the uh, room that we are interested in? For example, uh, given that I have a bedroom over here, these are the two examples that I have seen to train to, or to learn this particular decision boundary here. So now the question is that, can I specify Z equals to a bedroom and I want to generate a new scene over here that belongs to a bedroom or in this particular example here where I uh, can generate multiple images of either the bedroom or the dining room. And obviously the answer is no, that we, uh, if we simply learn this particular mapping function of X and uh, data and we want to map it into uh, Y over here or uh, to be more specific, it's actually Z over here that we are following this notation here. In the case of learning a discriminative model, we are simply learning this decision boundary and there's not, nothing more than this. And uh, so the, the answer is actually no, we cannot use the uh, discriminative model to generate the new images. But uh, fortunately, is that we can make use of the generative model. We can redesign the model and uh, to into a generative model for us to learn how to generate new images from the samples of images that we are given. Uh, so in most cases, the because this is deep network, we will require a lot of uh, these samples. That means that we need to know a lot of examples of the uh, images x1, x2 all the way to xn where n is actually a very large number as well as we also need to know the corresponding z1, uh, z2 all the way to z of n. So this means that for every image I need to know which class it comes from and uh, I'll be able to learn a uh, uh, deep network in order to do this. But this is not a Spec uh, this is not any deep network that we are looking at here. This is a specific class of deep network, which we call the generative uh, deep network. And uh, this will be used to generate new images that is unseen in the in all this training data set over here. And uh, we'll follow the likelihood model. The likelihood model, which is what we have seen earlier, uh, it's written as P of X conditioned upon CK.
and or otherwise if we were to write it in terms of the posterior uh, then we have to express this using the base theorem uh, where we need to flip this guy around where uh, we'll still end up with the same likelihood model multiplied by uh, the uh, prior of the class so this is proportional to this and what's interesting here is that uh, we'll see that by just considering a very simple graphical model of a generative uh, network we can actually use this to uh, derive a very sophisticated uh, deep network that is fully capable of generating new images given a certain condition and uh, here we'll look at the familiar graphical model that, uh, this graphical model over here which is uh, what we have seen in the Gaussian mixture model uh, lecture as well as the EM lecture where the joint distribution of this uh, graphical model here is simply given by P of X and Z conditioned upon the unknown parameters uh, data over here uh, this can be written into the likelihood multiplied by the prior so this is uh, f directly from this particular deep network here so what it means here is that the unknowns the latent random variable here Z and it's the class of the images that in the in our previous example and this directly gives rise to the type of images the observed image that we have so suppose that this ZN here is equals to a bedroom then what this graphical model means that is since this is directly the this latent random variable is directly influencing the observation then uh, what this means is that this particular image that we observe it better be a bedroom scene so uh, since it's conditioned upon Zn over here and of course uh, this whole graphical model over here is uh, parameterized by a set of parameters which we simply write as theta over here now having seen the graphical model as defined in the previous slide uh, and it's given by this particular joint distribution over here the factorized form of the joint distribution where uh, x condition upon z theta is the likelihood and z over here is the prior term of this uh, graphical model a simple idea on the how to draw a sample from this particular graphical model would be to first sample from the prior distribution of z uh, this prior distribution could be a categorical distribution as what we have seen in the Gaussian mixture model and the EM algorithm uh, lecture where uh, it could be in this case here in this example here uh, we can draw a sample from this categorical uh, distribution of the different types of rooms for example and uh, if we happen to sample something from the bedroom for example and Z would take a uh, uh, class of the bedroom and then uh, we will fix this z and uh, dump it into this particular equation over here and this equation over here so this is the bedroom and this could also be equals to the bedroom the first sample that we draw and then the next thing would be that we can directly sample from this particular distribution over here where we condition upon that z is equals to a bedroom so uh, uh, simple naive way would be that this is actually a Gaussian distribution or a mixture of Gaussian distribution now we say that uh, it fa falls into a certain uh, class of Z and we are going to directly sample from that class draw a sample from that class that corresponds to X over here and but unfortunately the problem of uh, the example that we are given is not that trivial because in this case here x what we are talking about here is a whole full image and we are going to generate every single pixel and not just that uh, we also have to make sure that this image really looks like an image it cannot be uh, any uh, set of collection of pixels that are random and here z here what it means here here is that z would also has to be correspondingly high dimensional so since x here corresponds to an image there are many combinations there are many possibilities of the uh, that x can take and uh, that hence z here must be uh, big enough for us to be able to accommodate the or, or to be able to map into all these uh, images that we are interested in generating so uh, that what this means is that simply by using what we have learned earlier on which is to parameterize this guy over here as a categorical distribution and the likelihood function here as a Gaussian distribution it would be insufficient for us to model this 
uh, complicated or sophisticated mapping from a very high dimensional prior term to the uh, a very high dimensional output space or the observation space of X over here, which happens to be a set of uh, images or an uh, image that we are interested in generating. The solution to resolve this is actually uh, first uh, let, let us define the prior over a very high dimensional space. This is what I have mentioned in the uh, earlier slide. Uh, and the idea here to bridge the gap between this where Z here is very high dimension and X here is also very high dimension. So what, we, we, what I was saying earlier is that there shouldn't be uh, a simple uh, mapping between these two or simple distribution between these two random variables. It's not going to capture the distribution in such a high dimensional space. So we'll mitigate this by introducing a set of deterministic functions here, which we denote as, as uh, f of z uh, theta. So this is this particular deterministic function, we are saying that it's parameterized by the parameter of theta here. And this helps us in mapping the very high dimensional space z over here into the possibilities of all the images that we wish to generate, as well as those that are in the observations. So since we are already given x1 uh, that corresponds to z1, and all the way to xn that corresponds to zn uh, as a training example. Then we also want this particular mapping function over here, the deterministic function here, to be able to capture this and map this into, given a z here, it should be able to map uh, it into a image, uh, an observation of uh, the x over here. So here a remark is that z is deterministic. Uh, so uh, you might want be wondering about this where when z is deterministic then there shouldn't be any uncertainty that can be captured in this particular model here uh, the answer is actually that uh, it's still able to uh, capture the randomness or the uncertainty in this particular way of formulating the solution so this is because z is a random variable while theta here is fixed that parameterizes uh, the function of f. So we have function of f, the inputs is z, which is a random variable over here. Uh, despite that theta here stays fixed. This means that this guy z, uh, f here is deterministic. The uh, overall output of this, since z is a random variable, what this means is that the output of this would also be a random variable in the space of the observation of x over here and hence it's still able to capture uncertainty and having introduced the deterministic function of f now our objective becomes that we have to optimize for the fixed set of parameters which we learn from the data such that we can sample from z which is our prior uh, random variable over here with a high probability that uh, the mapping from z the sample that we have drawn from this particular uh, random variable of a prior distribution of pz over here it will map into it will be mapped into uh, the x the desire output or the desire uh, observations that we want and what we are going to do here is that we are going to make use of all the training samples to fit this particular or function here into the mapping from z to x and uh, we are going to learn this uh, data here. And this can be achieved uh, probabilistically by doing the maximal likelihood uh, over here, where we simply want to do an argmax over the likelihood function, which is given by x condition upon theta over the uh, unknown parameters of theta. This is uh, what we have seen in the previous lecture when we look at the uh, all, all the graphical models, uh, we are learning the parameters of this graphical model. So here, we are just simply saying that we have an additional function that maps the random variable z to another random variable of x instead of using any standard uh, distribution over here. Now, uh, again, this would be uh, the standard thing to do when we do an argmax over the likelihood over theta. Uh, we can see that uh, according to this distribution over here, this x over here 
can be rewritten into uh, the joint distribution of x and z where z here is our latent random variable x here is our observed random variable condition upon theta and since we are only interested in doing the maximum likelihood function this means that we must marginalize away z over here hence there's an integration sign over dz since dz since z over here is in the continuous uh, random variable space so we'll do an integration sign over here where we can still define this particular likelihood function here to be a gaussian distribution so notice the difference is that uh, if we do not parameterize or if we do not introduce this particular uh, mapping function deterministic function over here we know that the gaussian distribution here is not sophisticated enough it's not powerful enough for us to uh, define the mapping function or to define the distribution between z and x because both z and x are living in very high dimensional space hence there's a need to uh, introduce this deterministic function that maps uh, the input space in a very high dimensional space into the output space which is also a very high dimensional space but nonetheless we are going to, to still uh, model this uh, as a Gaussian distribution but now here's the change over here that instead of modeling directly conditioned upon z over here we're going to say that uh, the normal distribution it has a mean uh, that is the output of the mapping function of z over here and uh, here the random variable of x which is what we are going to observe uh, it's going to be conditioned upon uh, this mean uh, which is the output from the deterministic function and a certain standard deviation defined by uh, sigma square over here so here we can simplify this uh, standard deviation or this covariance matrix by simply introducing a co isotropic covariance where uh, it simply means that we are going to have a, uh, since this guy here is high dimensional x here is high dimensional we can say that uh, uh, we will have a diagonal which is the same uh, sigma square for the whole of the diagonal and is the off diagonal terms are simply zero over here this means that it's a isotropic covariance uh, over all the dimensions of the random variable that we are interested in. now having defined the likelihood function here as a gaussian distribution that is actually parameterized by the deterministic function of uh, f of z and parameterized by theta over here we are still facing two problems in optimizing this or maximizing this likelihood term that we are interested in so this would be a max over uh, theta over here so the first uh, problem that we face that we are still facing is that how do we determine the latent uh, random variable z such that we can capture the latent information this means that we want to capture this particular distribution here and this term here is yet to be defined uh, the next thing is that uh, what is this is a usual problem that we have seen uh, in the EM algorithm that since the maximum likelihood here the likelihood term here involves the marginalization over all the latent random variable uh, we have to deal with this particular integration over here which are seen in the EM algorithm that this ends up with a non-trivial solution where we need to iterate between the expectation and maximization step so uh, we'll see in the next few slides on how we are going to handle this in uh, this particular setting here so as I mentioned earlier that uh, z here our random latent random variable it lies in a very high dimensional space. and it also has to be sophisticated enough for us to model the distribution of the output space which is our images and this means that all this uh, z over here it has to be sophisticated enough for us to model all the possible combinations of very high dimensional image in the output space that we wish to generate uh, a choice of this latent random variable would be uh, such that we can model it in a very complicated distribution however uh, it makes it very difficult it's almost impossible for us to just handcraft this particular latent random variable the distribution over this latent random variable that models the highly complex image outputs so in the case of the VAE the variational autoencoder which you are looking at in today's le lecture is that uh, since it's so difficult for us to uh, handcraft this or it's so difficult for us to actually uh, 
predetermined, a very highly complicated uh, distribution for the latent random variable. Let's just simply simplify this particular prior distribution and say that it actually follows just a normal distribution. Uh, that means that I'm going to assign, I'm going to draw this z over here uh, from a simple normal distribution. This i over here is actually in the dimension. It has the same dimension as the z over here. It can be a very high dimension space. But here I'm going to simply just say that uh, it's a normal distribution. I'm going to simply draw a sample of uh, this z over here from this normal distribution in the uh, in d-dimensional space uh, where uh, d could be a very high dimensional space. Uh, this is a little bit contradictory to what I have said earlier on where I mentioned that z here would have to be lying in a very sophisticated space in order to model the output space or the uh, this image space of x to be uh, very sophisticated as well. Uh, so uh, nonetheless, this can be done if we learn uh, this particular deterministic function here of f of z, which is what I have mentioned in the previous slides, that maps z to the output space, to the output space of x over here, where we say that after mapping it to the output space, it follows a normal uh, distribution here. So. Uh, in, in order to make this possible, this means that we are shifting the burden of modeling such a highly complex distribution of the output space from a very simplified version of the latent random variable. We are shifting this burden to the deterministic function over here. Since we say that this deterministic function is able to take in a latent random variable that are drawn from a very simple naive distribution. And we are going to rely on this. What it means is that we are going to rely on this transformation here, the mapping here, to map this into a very sophisticated space, a very sophisticated output space here. And the answer to this is that we can make use of a powerful function approximator to model this particular function here. And of course, this refers us to the uh, deep neural network, which itself is a very powerful universal function approximator. So as what I have mentioned in the previous slide that the key idea here is that we want to learn a very sophisticated uh, function approximator or where uh, this f over here is a deterministic function parameterized by data such that it can take z, the latent random variable here that is drawn from a very simple uh, prior distribution of p of z which we say that it's going to follow uh, just a very simple normal uh, distribution over here to any output space, any very sophisticated output space of x here. So in this example, x here would be our uh, images which can lie in a very high dimension and sophisticated space. Why is this possible? So mathematically, what we are doing here is that uh, we are simply drawing z here from a normal distribution that might look something like this. So this is our normal distribution. Note that this normal distribution uh, it's also an isotropic uh, normal distribution where uh, simply the covariance matrix here is given by an identity and uh, it's centered at zero mean over here. Uh, in this case, it's just a two-dimensional space. So I'm looking at the two-dimensional space uh, input or the random variable uh, space. And uh, suppose that I have a very sophisticated uh, function here, uh, which we can actually give in this example that uh, if, even if this particular mapping function is not that sophisticated uh, over here, which is simply given by z divided by 10 plus z divided by the absolute value of z. So what this means is that every value over here, every sample that I draw here, or every blue dot that I sample here, I'm going to make use of this and to map it into this space over here. So we can see that by just simply doing this drawing from a very uh, naive distribution, normal distribution, which has an identity covariance matrix over here, we can simply map all the samples into a distribution that we want, a very nice distribution here, which is in the output space of x. So this is simply given by this particular equation over here. So from this particular example, we can see that uh, it's possible to map uh, uh, the samples that is drawn from a very uh, naive 
distribution of a this particular normal distribution over here into a very sophisticated distribution of in the output space by simply just defining a simple function over here so the concept over here is that if this guy over here is going to be an image which is in a very highly sophisticated space uh, we can still do the same thing by drawing the latent random variable from a normal distribution but now what we are going to achieve is that instead of handcrafting a simple uh, function a simple mapping function that looks like this over here we're going to replace this guy over here we're going to replace this gx over here with a deep neural network that can map any input space that is drawn or any sample that is drawn from this naive uh, normal distribution into a very highly sophisticated space so uh, here uh, some remarks over the example that i've given is that uh, let f over here the deterministic function over here that we are interested in mapping uh, z to a sophisticated space be a multi-layer uh, neural network where data over here is the learnable parameter so in this case it can be a uh, uh, mlp it can be uh, all these neurons where it uh, connects each other and this all the weights of the neurons would be data then and this is what we are interested in learning or it could be also a convolutional kernel so in this case uh, it would be in my example of the image it will be uh, using cnns where we will simply convolve the kernel along the the image and what we are learning here would be the weights of the kernel that we are interested in so this would also be data over here in this example here and the second remark that we can make from this uh, the the definition of the deterministic function is that we can learn this particular deterministic function and ensure that it actually maps the uh, in from an input space of the latent random variable to the output space of x by uh, simply considering the this particular likelihood over here we'll we'll do a, a negative log likelihood or minimize the negative log likelihood or simply rewrite this term into the loss functions over here so what this means is that i'm given all the uh, samples or all, all the training samples of x and z so i have all the corresponding uh, images as well as the classes all the x and z I suppose i have n samples of this and what i want to do here is that i want to make use of all these observations all these given training samples over here and I want to fit it into this particular uh, graphical model that I have seen uh, that we have defined earlier defined by this data over here as well as z and x over here so these are zn and xn over here so uh, we saw that this graphical model can be parameterized by the likelihood function over here as well as the mapping function that gives uh, that maps z uh, from a very simple space to a very sophisticated space of output space of x over here and given all this training data the way to go is that since we uh, define this log likelihood or the, this likelihood term to be a normal distribution we'll simply uh, maximize or minimize this log likelihood uh, the negative of this log likelihood over here so in this case here i'm writing this as a log likelihood this means that i want to maximize this particular log likelihood here and uh, this be this particular form over here since we're taking a log over the exponential and we'll end up with the l2 loss over here this is otherwise known as the l2 loss so simply what it means is that for every sample that i am given for every sample that i'm given here x1 corresponding to z1 i would have the uh, corresponding z uh, over here so every sample that i have uh, suppose that i have z1 and i have x1 I'll put it through this particular network over here. This is uh, our neural network. I'll put it through this neural network at this particular uh, instance of the weight parameters. And then I will get the output and minimize the difference, the uh, L2 loss between the two terms over here, the uh, output space, as well as the, uh, the uh, ground truth output that we are given. And we are going to minimize this over all the samples that we are given over here. So N over here over the learnable parameters of data so we are going to do a argmax over the data term over here and this will uh, what this means is that by doing the optimization over data we'll learn a function of f which is parameterized by the learnable data over here such that we'll force this function to take in the input of z 
and you will force it to output x that is close to whatever training data that we have seen over here. So now we have resolved the problem, the first problem that we have talked about, which is how to define the latent space. And uh, in the uh, previous slide, we say that we want to maximize the log likelihoods. And the first problem that we face uh, is the definition of this latent space. We say that now we are going to simply define this latent space as a very naive latent space of the normal distribution of uh, parameterized by zero and identity. And uh, we are going to resolve this particular uh, problem of uh, sampling from a naive distribution and yet we want to map it into a very sophisticated output distribution by introducing the uh, function f which is uh, used to map take an input of z uh, parameterized by theta and used to map it into uh, the output space, a very sophisticated output space here. And then we saw that by defining this, we can simply uh, take this likelihood function as a normal distribution over x and f, and then uh, as well as an uh, identity of sigma square over here. And this ends up to be a L2 loss term over here. But we still haven't resolved the second problem. And that problem is that, because uh, do not forget that the ultimate aim is to uh, maximize the log likelihood, which is this term over here and not this term over here that we have seen in the previous slide. So what this means is that we need to take into account the integral sign over here. And this is the second problem that we have not uh, resolved. Here, uh, although we have defined these two terms already, the latent, ran the latent random variable distribution as well as the likelihood uh, distribution, we have not resolve this integration problem. So a straightforward solution that some of us might propose uh, since we have learned in the lecture of MCMC sampling is that uh, since this particular integration sign is so difficult for us to marginalize over the latent random variable here, why not just let us approximate it with uh, the samples, the log likelihood of samples. So, uh, this means that we are going to sample z from the posterior distribution and given enough sample, n number of samples, this means that the expectation uh, over here over the uh, likelihood term of x over here would be simply given by this expression over here. But unfortunately, it's not so straightforward because what we have also mentioned in the MCMC lecture or the Monte Carlo sampling lecture is that if the output space or if the random variable space is in, it lies in a very high dimensional space, then uh, n here would need to be extremely large according to the law of large number in order for the number of samples to be drawn from the distribution to be able to model the distribution, the target distribution well. So this means that uh, to approximate the log likelihood with the sample is not a viable uh, solution. And what would happen here if we insist on doing the sampling approach is that the output space might be lying in a very sophisticated uh, distribution over here. And what happens here is that there are a lot of regions where it's very low probability. But if we were to blindly draw samples from the posterior distribution and rely on the mapping function of f to map it into the output space, there is a huge possibility that all these samples in the output space might lie in uh, a very low probability distribution here. This means that the likelihood is almost zero for most of the samples. Uh, and uh, what this directly translates to our generative model in the image example is that we will be drawing samples from the normal distribution that we have defined such that it actually maps to a uh, infeasible output space. This means that the image that is generated from this model here will not look like any rooms at all. So in the earlier slide, I mentioned that the a naive sampling from the uh, normal distribution of z over here from our posterior distribution, which we have defined to be a normal distribution here, would simply end up to be mapped into using this uh, function that we have a uh, deterministic function that we have defined of f over here it will simply be mapped into a space of uh, low probability regions this means that 
uh, what it translates to in the example of the image generation is that uh, any samples here uh, or most of the samples that we draw from this particular distribution, the prior distribution here, would end up to be in a map, it will end up to be mapped into a region or a uh, uh, output of X that is invisible of a low probability uh, region. This means that this image that we have generated over here would not look like a, a proper image at all. So a lot, and this happens a lot of uh, in a lot of samples that we can draw from this prior distribution. So a solution to overcome this is actually to simply uh, constrain or simply to redefine this particular. Uh, distribution over here, the prior distribution that we can, that we're using to draw a sample of Z from. And uh, here we'll take the inspiration from variational inference that we have seen in the previous lecture, that instead of using uh, the prior distribution, defining the prior distribution as the normal distribution, directly the normal distribution here, we are going to define a proposal distribution which we call Q Z condition upon X. So here, uh, notice that we are conditioning this upon X because here this is the inputs that we have, and we want to make sure that uh, the outputs in the output space where uh, it's also the same X over here. We'll see this is the design of the autoencoder. That means that given the input, I want to reconstruct that uh, same input over here. And I want to compare the reconstruction loss over here. So we are simply saying that let's uh, define this proposal distribution or this uh, distribution of Q over here to replace our prior distribution here, uh, conditioning it upon the input space such that we'll be more certain that uh, or we'll be able to constrain the sample of Z that we are drawing from uh, would be more likely to produce a valid uh, output of X here. So to this end, uh, since we have introduced this uh, proposal distribution of QZ condition upon X over here, we will see that this turns the log likelihood into this function over here, this particular expression over here. And then we will also see that later uh, through this derivation, we will see that it, uh, it turns out to be the same as the variational inference where it's sufficient to uh, optimize over the lower bound instead of uh, optimize over the likelihood term over here, which also means that we can resolve the problem of the need to do an integration. And uh, here's the step over here where, where the log likelihood term is uh, given by this expression where we introduce this uh, Q of Z into the log likelihood term. You can see that this term here simply marginalized to be equals to 1. Hence, we multiply by log X, it will still be equals to uh, log x over here and we can rewrite these terms into this uh, expression over here and by manipulating these terms over here we will end up to uh, have uh, this expression here that uh, characterize the that expresses the log likelihood which we uh, we actually have seen it in the em lecture as well as the variational inference lecture which consists of a lower bound term so this is our uh, lower bound term as well as the KL divergence term over here. So we saw from our earlier lecture that this log likelihood uh, is, let's say it's this term over here, the log uh, Px over here. It will be a sum of our KL divergence term, which is always more than or equals to zero, as well as the lower bound term. So in order to uh, do a maximization over the likelihood term over here, we will uh, Simply, uh, instead of doing it directly on the uh, log likelihood term over here, we'll simply maximize the lower bound. And since this guy over here is more than or equals to zero, this means that we are always going to push this uh, in, into a higher term. We are going to maximize this, which also means that maximizing the lower bound here is equivalent to maximizing the log likelihood. And directly maximizing the lower bound, which is what we have also seen in the variational inference uh, lecture, is that we would avoid the situation where we need to optimize for this guy. So say if we are going to optimize this guy directly, this means that we need to optimize the lower bound together with the KL divergence. But in this case here, we cannot optimize this because we do not know this distribution over here. And uh, by 
what I've said earlier uh, and what we have seen in the previous lecture is that by optimizing over the lower bound would be equivalent to optimizing the log likelihood term over here. And thus, we would have uh, overcome two problems here. One would be the problem of the need to integrate over x, uh, z, and theta multiplied by pz, dz over here. So this would be avoided. And, uh, and then the, the another problem here is that uh, if we were to optimize it in the KL divergence and the lower bound expression over here, we'll need this term to be known, but we do not know this term. Uh, and as a result of optimizing only the lower bound, which is equivalent to this graphical, uh, this graph uh, expression over here, uh, we would have avoided the need to know this particular term over here. So rearranging the log likelihood term to make the lower bound the subject, we'll get this particular, uh, we'll end up with this expression over here. So this guy over here would be simply our lower bound, which is Q and theta over here. We are simply uh, shifting, moving this term to the left hand side and making this on the right hand side over here. So rearranging these terms over here, uh, we can rewrite this into this particular expression over here, which is equivalent to the first term here. We are going to take the expectation over x, uh, where z here is a sample that is drawn from the uh, from the q distribution that we are uh, that we have predefined earlier on. And now here there is also a KL divergence terms, but we will see that. Uh, it will be an expression that consists of the Q uh, probability distribution that we have uh, defined earlier, as well as the prior distribution of Z. So we know that this is going to be a normal distribution, and we also know this term is going to be a Gaussian distribution uh, given by this expression over here, X condition upon F, the output of F, Z, theta, as well as I sigma square over here. So we know all these terms, and the uh, only term that we are we have to define further would be uh, Q over here, where we need to draw sample from, as well as to make a KL divergence together with the uh, prior distribution. What this means is that we want Q here to be as close as this prior distribution as possible. And as a result, now since this particular term here uh, is our lower bound, which I have mentioned that uh, it's going to be uh, sum of this, so log px over here, it's going to be uh, this term over here, which is our lower bound plus the KL divergence term, which is strictly more than or equals to zero in this uh, representation here. So this means that maximizing the lower bound, which is what we have seen in the previous lectures, is equivalent to also uh, maximizing the log likelihood here. But that's one uh, subtle but important difference between what we have seen here in defining Q over here and the lower bound uh, in comparison to the variational approach that we have seen earlier. So realize that in the previous lecture, when we look at the variational approach, this lower bound here that we are interested in is just a function of Q, where Q here is a functional form. So we are not interested in uh, maximizing the log likelihood in the variational approach. But what we are interested in doing is that we are uh, interested in finding a Q function Z of X that is very close to the posterior distribution that we are interested in. Hence, we want to start from the minimization of the KL divergence which ends up to maximize over the lower bound uh, in the previous lecture. And uh, there is no mention about data because data is all absorbed into Z in the previous lecture. Uh, so in that case, over uh, in, in the variational approach, we are simply optimizing over the functional form of Q. And uh, there's no data in that particular lecture. It's all absorbed into Z. But in uh, the case of the EM algorithm, as well as what we are looking at right now, the VAE uh, here, we are interested in optimizing over data. That's our unknown parameter. Hence, we are doing a maximal log likelihood. So in the V uh, in the v, uh, variational inference case, this guy over here remains fixed. What we are simply interested in is to minimize this guy over here, which is equivalent to optimizing maximizing this guy over here. 
But now, since we are maximizing over theta, what this means is that I'm pushing this guy up, the uh, lower bound up. But since KL divergence term is also a function of theta, this means that, and it's more than or equals to zero, this means that I'm also going to push this up. As a result, the overall log likelihood is going to be pushed up in this case. Hence, we are maximizing the log likelihood. Here. Another insight over here would be uh, that since we have chosen, uh, or rather we have chosen to maximize the lower bound, uh, here in this case, the second term here, what it means is that, notice that I mentioned that uh, earlier on that we cannot simply sample Z from PZ because this will end up to be, uh, we will sample a lot of samples from, redundant samples from PZ that will end up being mapped into a low probability distribution in the output space. So we want to have Q here to be as close as to PZ, but we also want it to make, we also want to make sure that we sample reasonable uh, sample here that can be used to map to the output space. So uh, we can see that from these two terms here, it actually satisfy uh, what we want, our objective here. First, we want this QZ to be as close as to the prior probability distribution, which is given by the KL divergence term here. And then secondly, we want a sample that is drawn from this uh, proposal distribution Q over here to maximize the log likelihood over here, the log likelihood term over here, which means that all the samples that we have over here that we draw from this proposal distribution, it better gives us the output, a meaningful output that has a high enough probability space. So this first term here guarantees that uh, we are going to make sure that we draw reasonable or meaningful samples from the proposal distribution such that it maps to a high probability output space. And the second term here simply says that we want this distribution, we want this substitute proposal distribution to be as close as the normal distribution that we have predefined for the prior term as before. So we have seen in the previous slide that uh, maximizing the lower bound is equivalent to maximizing the log likelihood. And uh, we'll turn this maximization into a minimization uh, or otherwise uh, it's also known as a loss function which is a term that is used to define the objective for any deep neural networks. So here we're going to make use of this loss function which is given by the negative lower bound which is adding this negative term here uh, to train a variational autoencoder and we'll do so by uh, using the stochastic gradient descent algorithm uh, to uh, to train this uh, variational autoencoder. But intuitively what this means is that given many examples of the of uh, images, so x1 all the way to xn, we have a large number of uh, images. This is actually a self-supervised uh, learning technique where there is no need to have a label. We don't have to label where this particular image is coming from. Uh, all we need to do is just to take the image itself and we'll see that these two terms here, uh, the first term would be the our reconstruction loss and the second term over here would be the KL divergence that, that ensures that our, the, the neural networks is close to or the proposal distribution here, Q, is close to our uh, prior term. And we'll also call the first term here the likelihood term here, x condition upon z, our decoder uh, network, as well as the uh, q over here, which we have predefined earlier on to be our encoder network. So the reason why we call it encoder is because we want to first have this q over here, which inputs is our x over here. So all the training data that we are given, x over here, we want to encode this into the latent space, which is Z. And uh, here, uh, this latent space is, uh, uh, is what we use to encode the input space X. And normally, this Z is a lower dimensional space in the manifold uh, compared to our input space of X, which is an image over here. And then once we are encoded this into our latent uh, representation over here, so note that this is, uh, it, it has the same uh, meaning as our latent random variable, but we always call it the latent representation. This can be seen as an encoding of our 
input space, which is a higher dimensional space into a lower dimensional space. Then here the decoder, you can think of it as this way where we are inputting this uh, the latent representation of Z into this decoder since it's conditional upon Z to output a reconstruction of this particular image over here. So we'll see that the first term here is the reconstruction loss. That means that you end up to be uh, x minus x tilde and we want to minimize these terms over here. And the second term here simply says that the encoder, you will ensure that x is being encoded into a space that is uh, that falls into PZ. That means that the probability distribution, the prior distribution of Z here should be in a normal uh, distribution. We'll see exactly how this can be done in the next few slides. Uh, so let us first look at the second term, which is a KR divergence term here. Uh, this is to ensure that our uh, encoder over here, our encoder, which is given by Q over here, uh, it encodes the input of X into a distribution which is close to the prior distribution of the normal distribution, which is the normal distribution that we have defined earlier on. And here the encoder is just a neural network. It can be a N MLP or it could be a convolutional uh, neural network. But what is interesting here is that uh, in the VAE design, it's proposed that since we want to uh, make sure that this encoder is encoding X into a uh, Z, which is a latent representation that follows a normal distribution. Uh, but we don't want to enforce this exactly. Otherwise, then we might just as well uh, draw the sample from a normal distribution here. We simply want it to be close, but we don't want to make it strictly uh, a normal distribution here. So the the idea here to overcome this is that let's design this using a neural network. So uh, this would be a neural net, deep neural network over here, where we are going to take in X over here. And then after a few layers of the neural network, the outputs here would be defined as two outputs. One is the mu and one is uh, sigma over here which define a Gaussian distribution here. So this is given by this uh, expression over here, where we say that mu and sigma, it's a in, it's a, it takes in x as the input respectively, and it's parameterized by a set of uh, uh, neural networks parameter of uh, v over here. So v here would be, simply, uh, would be simply a subset of the data that we are trying to learn. And we are saying that uh, given x, this is going to encode, the neural network is going to encode uh, or output mu and sigma uh, from here. And this mu and sigma is going to represent the our z over here, our uh, distribution of the latent space over here. And what happens here is that we want to make sure that this particular distribution parameterized by mu and sigma is uh, as close as to 0 and 1 as possible. So here we want to minimize the difference between mu and zero as well as sigma and identity here and uh, we can easily do this by the KL divergence term over here which is given by the second term of the loss function as we have derived earlier on from the lower bound we can see that uh, since we define the prior distribution of z to be a normal distribution over here we can simply plug this term into this guy over here, P of Z over here. And we have defined this to be Q here to be a normal distribution of mu that takes in X and uh, the parameterized by V, as well as uh, sigma, which takes in X as well as parameterized by V over here. We can also plug this into this uh, Q over here, which we will see that it simply uh, turns out to be this expression over here. What this means is that we can simply minimize this or uh, do a partial differentiation with respect to all the Vs and simply minimize this KL divergence uh, loss term over here. In order to force the latent space, this particular distribution, which is uh, defined by our encoder over here, it takes in an image and it outputs mu and sigma, which parameterize the latent space. We want this to be as close as the normal distribution of uh, zero and identity as possible. But note that we do not want this to be exactly uh, close to or exactly taking the form of the normal distribution. Otherwise, it defeats the purpose because the very reason why we want to do this is that uh, 
the samples drawn from this distribution, the normal distribution, uh, will end up to be mapped into a, a low dimensional space, output space. So we want also the second term here. We want some flexibility here. That's why we define this uh, to be as close, but not exactly the same here, because we also want it to have a high probability space, uh, which we will look at uh, in the first term of the loss function here. So uh, let's consider the first term now. So recall that we model the de decoder as uh, P of X conditional upon Z. So this means that we are going to have uh, something like this where we draw a sample. So now uh, this particular latent space is no longer PZ. We just want PZ here, which is uh, following the normal distribution, to be as close as to QZ. But we are going to make use of this to draw our uh, to draw our latent uh, random variable z over here. So this is parameterized by mu of uh, x and uh, v as well as sigma of x and uh, v over here. We'll draw a sample from this normal distribution here and then we're going to input this into a decoder which is also a deep neural network. It's another deep neural network parameterized by theta over here. So this is our decoder and then uh, we are going to simply uh, output the reconstructed image over here. So uh, let's take a look at this the encoder part. We have an encoder that takes in an image over here, denoted by X, and it's encoding it, it's outputting the uh, this latent space or this uh, of the random variable Z. And then the next step is that we simply draw a sample from here, from this latent space over here. And we are going to use the decoder to decode this into a reconstruction of that original input uh, image. And we'll see that since we have defined this to be uh, following uh, this particular uh, x condition upon z over here, this likelihood term over here, we've seen earlier that we parameterized this using a normal distribution. That is uh, described by a deterministic function of f parameterized by theta. So uh, we'll uh, which we say that this is a learnable neural network. So this will form our decoder over here. And we are going to uh, simply uh, going to learn these particular parameters with our uh, training data, which is all the images that we have. And we'll see that uh, this adds up to be just a reconstruction loss over here. And then substituting the normal distribution that is parameterized by the deterministic function of f over here, which is our deep network uh, in the decoder, we can see that this expectation term can be evaluated into this particular expression over here by writing out the full normal distribution expression here. And uh, since we have a log term over the exponential, and this is a constant term that can be brought here, we can see that we'll end up with a L2 loss, a square loss, between the reconstructed image over here and the image training sample that we are given. So this means that this term here is the reconstruction loss over a sample that we sample from the latent that is given by a sample from the uh, this latent distribution learned from the encoder network. So what this means is that uh, since we enforce x tilde, which is the output of our decoder of the whole VAE, now, what this means is that we want this to be uh, a realistic image as compared to our training data. So this ensures that we maximize this particular uh, log likelihood term over here. So what this means is that we want to learn a latent space such that it's close to the normal distribution that we have defined for the prior term, as well as uh, we want to resolve the problem. We have seen that we actually resolve the problem by saying that this latent space, the new latent space that we uh, define, not only that is close to this uh, prior distribution, it's also uh, going to uh, be meaningful. That means that once we have mapped the latent random variable that we have drawn from the latent space uh, using the f function that we have defined earlier, the output, which is the reconstruction of this image, must maximize this likelihood, which in terms of means that it must be a realistic image as compared to the input training image here. Hence, this L2 loss here must be minimized. And this is what we call the expectation image reconstruction loss. So putting the encoder and the decoder loss terms together, we'll get this particular uh, loss term here where 
this guy over here is simply the reconstruction uh, loss and this guy here is simply the KL divergence loss over here and we can simply uh, minimize this uh, loss term using by computing the gradient over every sample that we draw from the data set so every image that we drawn from the data set and then after that we will uh, given the encoder network we will output the laden space and we will draw another sample from the laden space such that we can reconstruct the image and uh, minimize this particular loss using uh, gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent approach but there is still one more problem that is uh, existing in this particular formulation that is after we have uh, take the uh, derivative of this particular loss term here over the parameters that we wish to learn we can see that the first term here unfortunately it's independent of the uh, encoder network what this means is that we are minimizing this l2 loss here this is our reconstruction loss here but uh, this reconstruction loss here when we take the gradient is going to flow back here since this particular loss here is only dependent on the decoder it means that the gradient is not going to flow all the way down here which means that uh, by training the reconstruction loss we are not affecting the encoder at all we are not uh, uh, we are not trying to enforce this guy here as what we have set up to learn that this guy here not only it must be following a normal distribution which is actually given by this second term here we can see that the derivative here partial derivative here is going to the gradient is going to flow back here which means that we are going to learn this guy to make sure that it generates a latent space that is close to the normal distribution but we are since the uh, the gradient is going to stop here at this particular point here it means that we are not going to uh, ensure that the latent space that is learned from the encoder it's going to generate a uh, uh, output space or output that is a uh, very highly probable uh, which means that it needs to be realistic since the reconstruction loss is not going to affect this part of the network here so the idea to overcome this particular problem that we have uh, seen earlier uh, is uh, actually proposed in the original paper which is in the second reference that i've given in the start of the lecture uh, the paper written by uh, king ma and welling and uh, they call it the reparameterization trick in order to ensure that the gradient flows from the reconstruction loss to the decoder as well as the encoder so uh, instead of sampling just now I mentioned that uh, once we have a, a sample x from the data the next thing is that by putting this into this x into our encoder which is q of z x this will output mu and sigma over here so the next thing that we do uh, as uh, before was to sample a z from this normal distribution of mu and sigma uh, here but the problem with this is that it gets uh, the gradient flow from the reconstruction loss gets stuck before it can actually influence the encoder network so instead of sampling uh, directly uh, here doing the sampling in this latent space here from the normal distribution here uh, we are move the sampling to the input layer this means that instead of just sampling x from d we'll also sample a, a, a sample draw a sample from a normal distribution of 0 and 1 here and here uh, these are the exact steps over here so instead of sampling from this guy here we'll simply sample first uh, treat this as an input together with x over here uh, we will draw a sample from the normal distribution of 0 and 1 then we will compute z we will get the sample in the latent space by simply taking the output the mu of the encoder network as well as sigma from the encoder network multiply by a certain uh, noise or certain random sample that we have uh, sampled earlier so this guy over here this expression over here is equivalent to drawing a sample from the normal distribution of the uh, which is given by the outputs of the decoder but uh, here in this case over here uh, we have shifted the burden or we have shifted the problem uh, of uh, sampling you know, where we will get the, the where the 
gradient of the decoder will get stuck at this particular point not in, and not being able to influence the encoder uh, by just uh, simply doing the sampling in the input space over here. And hence, the uh, this adding in this reparameterization trick into the loss term over here, we will get this uh, expression over here. And our gradient now, we can see that uh, it's actually a function of uh, Q, uh, Z, and X. Our reconstruction loss here, it's no longer just a function of uh, is no longer just a function of our decoder x of z over here now because there is a mu and there's a sigma which is a function of x in our encoder network so after doing the reparameterization trick we can see that since we shifted the sampling from the latent space over here previously it was uh, drawing a z from the normal distribution of the output of uh, the decoder or the encoder uh, mu and sigma which is a function of our input of x here in this step here and this would inhibits the uh, flow of the reconstruction loss gradient from the decoder to the encoder and now we are in the reparameterization trick we saw that uh, we are going to shift this uh, uh, sampling from this uh, area to the input of the uh, network so we're simply going to treat this as an input and then once we have uh, the output from the encoder we sample the x over here from the all the data and once we have encode this particular x into mu and sigma we'll simply concatenate this or we'll simply multiply this uh, uh, noise that is sampled from the normal distribution to sigma and uh, this will be uh, act as a sample that we have drawn from the latent space well while uh, the KL divergence term in the uh, to enforce this latent space to be close to the normal distribution remains unaffected but as a result we can see that now the gradient flows back from the reconstruction loss all the way to the decoder and the encoder and hence we are uh, now ensuring that this sample here the encoder uh, is a sample drawn from the encoder is able to give us a reasonable output that looks like an image or to maximize the log likely finally here's the summary or the pseudo code for the uh, variational auto encoder training so given a data set since this is a self-supervised learning technique uh, what this means is that we don't have to have the any labels for this uh, uh, data set that we train we can just stick any images that we are interested in and then we initialize the parameters of uh, the encoder and decoder of course we need to design the encoder and decoder network and we'll repeat until convergence we'll simply uh, randomly select a mini batch of m samples from x and then uh, we'll first sample the uh, noise this is our input in the mini batch and this is our noise as what we have described earlier from the normal distribution of 0 and 1 then we'll compute the loss uh, the two terms of the loss the reconstruction loss as well as the KL diversion loss in the forward pass and we'll compute the gradient uh, from this loss and uh, update and back propagate them uh, back to the decoder and encoder and update these uh, gradients uh, from, from there so I'm not going to into the detail of the uh, how to train a neural network because uh, this back propagation, forward propagation and all this uh, stochastic gradient descent it's uh, actually out of scope of this particular lecture uh, you should be if you're interested I strongly encourage you to take the deep learning module uh, which is also a uh, level 5000 module uh, I think in this semester and it's also offered in the next semester to understand this clearer motivation here is that I just want to simply uh, relate the the graphical model concepts that we have learned to deep learning